as a member of the leadership council of the museum, I want to make a couple of announcements first um, of upcoming events this week. The first is a chamber music um, on campus noontime concert on Friday, uh, March 1st, um, which is by the students in the School of Music and Dance. And the second, uh, directly related to what we're going to hear about today, um, is a West of Center panel on the Eugene counterculture then and now. That's on Sunday, uh, March 3rd at uh, 2 p.m. Um, I'm Jeff Haynes. I'm from the uh, Department of History, and I'm also the director of the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies. But more importantly, uh, I'm a friend of a friend of Violet Ray's, um, and I flew in from Japan for this presentation. <laughs> well, not o not not only for this presentation, but I did fly in from Japan a couple of days ago. But um, um, as a child of the '60s uh, myself, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised uh, by the chain of events that led to the riveting display of Violet Ray's art uh, upstairs. Uh, it's just karma, man, as we used to say uh, back in the day. Um, when I first heard about the West of Center exhibit some months back in a program meeting here in the museum, I remember thinking, "Cool." communes, cooperatives, I can relate to that. I've been, I've been there, I've done that myself back in the day, literally. But then, um, as uh, Jesse and Kathy, the young curators, talked more about the artistic angle of the exhibit, about the edginess of artistic expression that attended our really tumultuous lives in, uh, in the 60s as we raged against the Vietnam War, among other things, and embraced alternative ideologies like utopian socialism and pacifism, uh, et cetera, I also thought, hey, I know a guy. And uh, that guy, of course, uh, is the artist known as uh, Violet Ray. The artist known as Violet Ray uh, doesn't drive a little red Corvette, but a Subaru. Um, I actually knew him as a fellow historian um, and as a friend, and occasionally in an artistic incarnation. Uh, as the creator of the famous Sarah Palin alarm clocks um, and as uh, the creator of the anti-authoritarian projections that many of you may have seen downtown now and then. But I also knew bits and pieces about his life prior to Eugene as an artist activist in San Francisco in the 60s. So after telling the curators of the exhibit about Violet Ray, I told Violet Ray about the exhibit. And I promised to share with him a copy of the catalog of West of Center uh, that I'd obtained via interlibrary loan. Long story short, we were sitting um, at a party at a friend of ours, mutual friend, and I gave Violet the catalog as I said that I, that I would. And he opened it up and he began to read it and he was sitting across the room. And then I looked up and he was motioning to me like this. And I walked over and sat next to him and he pointed to a plate in the middle of the catalog. And I can't recall exactly how he put it, but he said something on the order of, that's mine. <laughs> uh, in other words, he is in the West of Center uh, exhibit, broadly, uh, broadly conceived. Um, from that point on, um, Jesse and Kathy and Kurt uh, took it from there. They visited, uh, and of course, they decided uh, to create this great um, exhibit upstairs of subversive uh, anti-authoritarian uh, protest, uh, protest art. Um, that art, as some of you may know, was first made in the 60s and then put away. Taken out by Violet Ray again in the 80s, published as a book, then put away. It's now been taken out again uh, in 2013, uh, and you can see this display of collages, uh, collages for yourselves. Um, Violet will talk about um, the art um, itself, about the collages themselves, but I want to say something or observe something about them first. And this also is, is anecdotal and it relates to the opening of the exhibit it, it's, itself, to which I invited a bunch of friends, some of whom are part of the Eugene counterculture and have been here since actually the early 60s. One of these guys um, who created a house truck, a wonderful, beautiful, a house truck that is just a kind of symbol of that, uh, of that day, uh, was looking at Violet Ray's uh, exhibit, ignored the rest of West of Center for quite a long time. And again, I can't recall his exact words, 
uh, but what he said is something on the order of they're just as relevant now uh, as they were in the 60s. Um, and I think that that, to me anyway, that attests to their greatness as works of art, if also to the sad fact uh, that our lives are still consumed uh, by the consumer culture that they uh, critique. A consumer culture that continues to prevent us from realizing what Violet Ray calls uh, in a really poignantly nostalgic, utopian way that many of us can, uh, can recall from the 60s themselves that prevent us from achieving what he calls a true society. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce the artist known as Violet Ray. Thank you, Jeff, for that candid introduction. <laughs> you know, you really are the unsung hero of this event. I still think it was your uncanny psychic powers <laughs> that first brought the, my artwork to the attention of the curators here. I would like to thank Jill Hart and Kurt Neugebauer, Jesse Dettiglio, and all of the staff at the museum. It's been a real pleasure to work with you in preparing this exhibit. Now, I imagine some of you may be wondering about this Violet Ray logo on the screen behind me. Uh, well, what can I say? Forty years ago, that's the way I looked. <laughs> <laughs> all, all kidding aside, I have to tell you, it's great to be back in the counterculture. <laughs> Even if we are museum specimens now. <laughs> now. During the heyday of the counterculture movement, I was always an advocate of working within the belly of the beast. The collages that you see on display here at the museum are a product of that belief, of wanting to use the everyday language of advertising to protest the war in Vietnam. As Jeff pointed out, actually I was already part of West of Center, at least indirectly, because one of my collages had been reproduced in the companion book for the original show at the Denver Museum of Contemporary Art. I had forgotten that uh, three years ago, Tom Wilson, the author of an article titled Paper Walls, Political Posters in the Age of Mass Media, had, had emailed me asking permission to reproduce my Spell of Chanel collage. In the course of our correspondence, Tom made this remark, which I think speaks to the question of how these collages have had such a long afterlife. It is surprising and somewhat worrying, Tom wrote, to notice that the collages see, uh, have still have lost little of their power. In many ways, this is the recurring story of these artworks. As you will soon see, New, on numerous occasions over the past 46 years since their inception, they've kept coming back to life. Now, in one of my, my other lives, I became a historian. So bear with me now as I give you some highlights from a history of the collages, a history that I hope will help you to understand why they still have impact. I'd like to mention at this point that uh, some of the collages that you're going to see in the presentation tonight are not in the show. They are in the catalog, and uh, some of them are important in the development of the collage technique. As both a historian and a, an artist, I've learned how difficult it is to evoke the deeply disturbing atmosphere 
of the Vietnam War era. Unlike the sanitized wars today in Iraq and Afghanistan, the wounds of the Vietnam War were visible every day on the TV news and in magazines and newspapers. As this cover from a 1966 Life magazine illustrates, In the same, even the enemy's wounds were visible in the same pub publications, often with a bluntness that hit you in the pit of your stomach. In effect, the TV news coverage and the magazines and newspapers brought the ugliness of this war into the living rooms of millions of Americans every week, every night. In these same magazines, the brutalities of the war often appeared side by side with advertisements like this one for <laughs> Revlon's Eterni Eterna 27, uh, a skin cream for aging women. When a woman passes the age of innocence, what can she turn to? The text <laughs> reads. It was a juxtaposition of this ad with another photo from the Vietnam War that gave me the original idea for creating my own advertisement against the war. In many ways, the discovery of this collage technique came as a byproduct of this impulse to create my own ad. When I inserted this picture of a young Vietnamese woman losing her innocence not by aging, but at the end of a bayonet. However, I want to emphasize right now that my initial impulse was not to deface the ads or even to deconstruct them, but rather to put the medium to work for my own purposes, to employ the language of advertising itself to protest the war. It was a short step from this rather simple Eterna 27 collage to an appropriation of this Christmas ad from Polaroid. While the actual collage technique in this instance was rather straightforward, it taught me early on the advantage of working the inserted image into the existing advertisement in a seamless fashion, so that it appeared, at least just for a moment, that the Vietnam snapshot was actually part of the ad. This Revlon O oh Baby Face ad appeared in the March 3rd, 1967 issue of Life. The image of the wounded Vietnamese girl was typical of the many disturbing photos of Vietnamese children that had already appeared in the media. <coughs> I felt that such photos aroused mainly a humanitarian concern for the victims, but they were not connected to the everyday life of American consumers. By placing the girl's photo inside the advertising stream itself, the same image suddenly had an explosive effect, forcing consumers to make complex associations with their own lifestyle and everyday uh, beliefs. One of the most satisfying side effects of this collage technique is revealed by a comment made by several, on several occasions by people who told me you know, I saw that Revlon O Baby Face ad the other day, but something was missing. <laughs> Gradually, uh, I became more aware of the subtleties involved in integrating such imagery seamlessly into existing ads. Achieving this effect required a careful coordination of the color, 
and lighting and placement of the inserted images in the overall composition of the ad. Remember, all this was done with scissors and rubber cement. <laughs> there was no Photoshop in those days. <coughs> As I describe in the introduction to my book, I discovered that the physical act of cutting up the ad was extremely satisfying. <laughs> I'm not sure that today's Photoshoppers are getting the same pleasure out of their mashup. In April of 1967, only a few months after the first collages were created, thousands of leaflet-sized black and white reproductions of three collages were printed up to and handed out to curbside onlookers at a anti-war march on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Some 250,000 people took part in that protest. Surprisingly, it had proved impossible to get funding for the printing of those leaflets from the organizers of the march, who claimed they were too sophisticated. <laughs> On the contrary, during the march, people ran up to us to grab the leaflets out of our hands, shouting, what's Revlon doing in this march? Moments later, we heard their shouts of consternation as our anti-war protest exploded in their hands and minds. The first public exhibition of the original collages took place a few months later in June 1967 at the Eye Makers Gallery in Aspen, Colorado. The gallery was a room that we rented to mount an anti-war protest during an international design conference that was being held in Aspen at the time. This is the original hand-painted sign for the gallery that I have brought out of mothballs for you tonight. <laughs> and this is the original flyer that was used to publicize the event. The title of the show, which runs along the edge, was Madison Avenue Escalates. Inspired by this exhibition, Bill Dunaway the editor of the Aspen Times, the town's uh, weekly newspaper, decided to run reproductions of the ad collages on his editorial page as examples of what he called great American advertising art. He ran that series for 20 weeks in a row during the height of the anti-war protest that year. Moreover, he ran that same series again the following year. Now, while the Aspen Times has a very small circulation, then I think it was about 7,000, it did reach an elite audience, including the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who had a vacation home outside of Aspen. Publication of these collages then was a courageous act on Bill's part. And in hindsight, he was one of the few editors in publish who actually risked legal action from the company whose ads were used in the collages. When Bill received a call from J. Walter Thompson in New York City, protesting the publication of one of their ads, Bill said, that's not an ad. It's a collage by a local artist. If you want to press the issue, I'll put the story on the AP wire. <laughs> <laughs> he never heard another word from any <laughs> ad agencies. Over the years, I think the greatest deterrent to legal action against these artworks has been the likelihood 
that it would only give more exposure to the collages. In the fall of 1967, what a year that was, um, three of the ad collages were printed up as posters, black and white posters, in editions of 5,000 copies each. Rather naively, I had thought it would be quite easy to distribute these posters through independent bookstores and movement outlets. However, I soon discovered that hardly anyone would actually, was actually willing to take the risks that Bill Dunaway had taken when he published the collages in the Aspen Times. And the problem was not only concern about copyright issues, but it also reflected, I think, a lack of appreciation for using the advertising medium for protest. One of the few publications that did take up the cause was RAT, an underground anarchist newspaper on the Lower East Side in New York City. While they were obviously plugged into the drug, the drug scene, as this cover illustrates, they were also radical political activists. In 1968, they became distributors of the posters themselves. More importantly, they actively publicized the equivocal responses of booksellers who refused to carry them. They even named the names of the bookstores and quoted the store managers. The title of their article, Bananas Are Dead This Year, was a remark made by a bookstore manager with regard to this early version of the Chiquita collage. In the summer of 1967, ghetto riots in New Newark, New Jersey, produced extensive coverage of those protests, like this July 28th issue of Life. So I began to think about applying the same collage technique to other themes and issues, like racial prejudice. This photo of a cigar-smoking cop striding past the body of a African-American boy in Newark appeared in that same issue of Life magazine. The week before, in the July 21st issue, I ran across this wet and wild 7-Up ad with the text that read, the rugged individualist, bold, cold, crackling. Nothing tastes like 7-Up but 7-Up. Within a week, I had cut up the original life photo and reassembled the figures as part of a new 7-Up ad collage. Once again, by placing the figures from the life photo inside the 7-Up advertisement, the result was if the cop had walked past the boy's body right into your living room. And the rugged individualism of the ad's text took on an ugly undertone which heightened, I think, the pathos of the incident and also the coldness of consumer culture toward ghetto poverty and racism. Some of these collages about racial prejudice were in a lighter vein, like this white horse, Scotch ad. But others probed the deep-seated desires for justice among all African Americans. This wrinkled black hand could be that of a slave reaching out of the country's dark past to press the punish button. Sometimes I wish we had punish buttons on our computers today. <laughs> now in the fall of 1967, when the feminist movement burst on the scene, I began to apply uh, the collage technique to issues related to women's liberation. This Bonnie Bell collage dates from 1968. 
and it marks the beginning of the profound influence that feminist ideas would have on my artwork and on my artistic persona. One of the most striking things about my collage technique is the way it draws attention to and changes the meaning of the ad's text, revealing not only its superficiality, but also creating painful new associations when juxtaposed with images like this one. People often think I've changed the text. They cannot really believe that an ad for pantyhose like this would address female customers as you dummy or portray the model in such a vulnerable position. The simple addition of the weapon in the margin of the ad brings home the violence that's inherent in both the text and the image. In collages like this one, I began to focus more on the nature of advertising itself <coughs> in addition to working on political themes. If we look closely at advertisements, it's amazing what they're actually telling us. This Boise Cascade ad, for example, states very clearly that corporations play an important role in creating the values of consumer society, while demonstrating, at the same time, their view of that society as a beehive. Eventually, I addressed uh, other themes uh, having broader implications like this, this one that brings uh, weight loss and hunger together uncomfortably for consumers of Carnation Slender products. This collage, which was created in 1973, now has a disturbing new association in a society which seems to worship bullets. On a purely technical level, I think it's a marvelous example of the coordination of lighting, color, and composition to make it appear that the bullets are actually inside the bottle. On several occasions when I exhibited my collages and they were not covered by glass, if I wasn't paying attention, I would turn and discover someone with their finger on the collage trying to find the edge. Where is the edge? And that's, that was the goal of my seamless collage technique, was to make them work hard on that. Now, uh, I, I'm sure that some of you must be thinking now, you know, what's this guy got to do with west of center? Most of these collages were created in New York City and on the East Coast. The Denver curators of the West of West of Center maintained that the counterculture was a movement based in the American West and that San Francisco was its capital. Of course, the first public exhibition of the collages did take place in Aspen, Colorado. I got a toe in the door there. But I earned my West of Center credentials in January 1972 when I moved from the East Coast to San Francisco. In keeping with another West of Center theme, the focus of my activism then shifted from politics to culture when I decided to devote all of my energies to the graphic arts. What's more, my move west also involved a personal transformation. Since it was in San Francisco that my artistic persona, Violet Ray, was born. Now, you know by now that this is not how I looked as 40 <laughs> years ago. But this is how I looked. <laughs> it's the new Violet Ray persona that I created west of center, in the capital of the counterculture, no less. 
For many years, one of my favorite American artists had been Man Ray, whose work with found objects suited my taste for working with everyday objects from consumer culture. Pictured here, you see one of Man Ray's most famous found object sculptures. Well, well, not quite. That's actually one of the many replicas that I made as a kind of irreverent homage to him. So when I was looking around for an artistic souvenir, I decided to become a kind of illegitimate offspring in the Man Ray family. <laughs> As it turned out, there were lots of choices. There were Sun Ray and Moon Ray, the hippie rays. There was Gamma Ray and X-Ray, those dark sci-fi rays. And of course, Sting Ray, the aquatic ray. He just swam away one day. We don't know what happened to him. <laughs> These uh, all seemed a bit one-dimensional to me. So in the end, I like the sexual ambiguity of the name Violet. Not to mention the possibilities for mischief in the macho media world where so, mu so much of my artistic interest lay. My choice of this gender-bending first name also reflected the influence feminist ideas had on me. Everyone from Betty Friedan to Valerie Solana. In the first years on the West Coast, my uh, found object sculptures took off in a slightly different direction. I wasn't interested in perpetuating the Dadaist or Surrealist traditions per se. I was still mainly interested in exploring the contradictions of mass media and, and, and consumer culture, or the glamorization of violence in the fashion world. As you can see, Feminist sentiments were still an important theme in many of these found object sculptures. I think this piece would look very nice out in the lobby at Outsen Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> in 1974, having accumulated a large number of these artifacts in, my, in the living room of my apartment, I decided to open a storefront gallery called Ice Pick to show my own artwork. The storefront was located on Grant Avenue in North Beach, the heart of the old Beatnik neighborhood, which by then had become something of a tourist mecca, which assured me of a steady flow of pedestrians on the sidewalk outside. This snapshot of the interior doesn't really do justice to the intimacy of the objects or the charged atmosphere that they created when assembled together as a kind of consumer culture nightmare. <laughs> One art critic noted that Ice Pick was a living room full of pub pubescent silver mannequins armed with pistols and mirrors which dramatized the sexual attitude and violence of the fa fashion world. On the walls at Ice Pig, I hung photo reproductions of the ad collages, thinking then that they would not have much impact since the Vietnam War was winding down then. Sitting in the gallery every day, however, I was surprised to see how much impact they still had and how many I was able to sell. Despite that experience, several months later, I made yet another serious misjudgment about the lifespan of these collages. In my closet, I had several thousand copies of the posters that I had not been able to distribute, thinking that their work was done as the Vietnam War ended, I tossed them into a dumpster outside my apartment in Noe Valley. 
The next morning, when I went down to get the newspaper, I discovered that someone had dug the posters out of the dumpster and taped up posters on every light pole and <laughs> telephone pole on 24th <laughs> Avenue, the main street of Noe Valley. In 1975, after closing Ice Pick, I began to focus more on performance art. The central theme of these artworks still dealt with the influence of mass media and advertising on American society and culture. In 1975, at the Alameda flea market, I purchased some unmounted panels for a solar cane billboard featuring this figure. Some of you may remember her. I cut the figure out and mounted it on thin plywood panels with handles on the back side so that it could be moved around in the streets and carried uh, wherever I wanted to take it. The first public outing for this mounted figure was in 1980 at the annual Castro Street Fair where it won first prize of $100 for the best costume of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Two years later, when uh, nationwide anti-nuclear protests and demonstration broke out across the country, the same figure reappeared as a nuclear burn victim, accompanied by a large black disc that said, don't get burned by nuclear power. Unfortunately, on June 12, 1982, at one of the largest of those demonstrations in San Francisco, the figure itself became a target of protest. As marchers gathered in Dolores Park to march downtown, a group of angry women forced me to take the figure down. In a curious twist of fate, However, my image <coughs> found an even larger audience the following morning when this photo appeared as the only illustration for the San Francisco Chronicle's article about the demonstration. Now, for nearly 20 years, <coughs> I had been trying unsuccessfully to find a publisher to do a book about these collages to preserve them, really. In 1984, fed up with the equivocation that I'd met in the publishing world, I decided to self-publish a slick magazine-style catalog containing 31 reproductions of the best of these artworks. Now, the printer in Hong Kong had no qualms about doing his job. He was not concerned at all about any copyright issues. But to protect myself from legal action by the companies at home, I consulted with a lawyer. And uh, the book was printed as a catalog for an art exhibition at the New College of California. The lawyer that I consulted recommended that I make this statement on the inside front cover, stating explicitly that the collages were not advertisements, but rather an artistic statement about the culture created by advertising. That gave me the idea of placing in very fine print at the bottom of each page, each collage, a cover, every page, the statement this is not an advertisement. <laughs> of course, uh, that statement only called more attention to the fact that they were advertisements. So. During the collage exhibition at New College one day, I was in the gallery when a young, uh, when a middle-aged man came in to view the show. He spent a long time looking at each individual artwork, and finally, he called me over to this collage, I mean this ad, and said, you know, I created that ad. 
for a moment. I thought, well, he's going to ask me to take that down and remove it from the show. But he smiled and said, this is why I got out of advertising. <laughs> now, publication of the book marks yet another moment of rebirth of the collages. One of my principal motives in publishing uh, the catalog was to archive the artwork, which I thought uh, were essentially fragile paper collages that would uh, disintegrate. However, as you can see from this comment made in 1986 by a reviewer from the media journal After Image, once again, I had underestimated their continuing impact. A seminar could be spent discussing why it is, after 20 years, these arrangements are so successful. Uh, by the way, I would still like to teach that seminar <laughs> if anybody in the School of Journalism and Communications is listening. <laughs> A further evidence of their continuing uh, impact came the same year when the Whole Earth Review, a classic counterculture publication, if you will, published several of the collages in this issue of their journal. Moreover, they published them, they published this collage on the back cover in color. And in addition, four more collages appeared on the inside back cover, accompanied by some quotations from the introduction to the book. Following the book's publication, the, the original collages were were exhibited in a number of uh, one-man shows in Los Angeles, Berkeley, Santa Fe, Barcelona, and in the Northwest uh, at Portland State and Western Washington up in Bellingham. In 1986, they were part of a group show at the New Mexico Museum of Fine Arts entitled Subversive Acts artists working with the media politically, which in fact featured also participation by other media artists like Jenny Holzer and Hans Hockey. As you can see, the collages figured very prominently in this review of the exhibition in the Albuquerque Journal. Uh, this snapshot was taken at the Galleria Tartessus in Barcelona, Spain where the original collages were exhibited in January 1986. That's my wife, Anuncia's mother, thumbing through the catalog at the opening reception. And while we're on the subject of family, <laughs> this, this is a picture of me with my son, Tavi, who was born the same year that the catalog was published. 1984. Yeah, please note that I'm wearing the same <laughs> jacket and shirt <coughs> tonight that I wore in that picture. So you're getting the real thing. <laughs> in the late 1980s, the magazine Adbusters was founded and led the way in a new, a very creative artistic movement called Culture Jam. I consider myself uh, something of a pioneer in the development of this technique, even though I've not been able to convince the founding editor of Adbusters, Kali Lassen, to acknowledge this fact <laughs> or to publish any of my collages. The best of the pseudo ads or spoofs. <laughs> the best of the pseudo ads or spoofs fashioned by these culture jammers at Adbusters involve, as you can see, mimicking in very creative ways the ad styles and the real brand names of well known consumer products. <laughs> in, in my opinion, In my opinion, they demonstrate the value 
of borrowing <coughs> these advertising motifs for protest. For many media artists, the time has come to put the pop icons to work, <coughs> along with the advertising slogans, to counter the values and beliefs that they are communicating to the public. Now, this is one of my favorite counter ads from Adbusters. One, I think, that hits home for U of O students, faculty, and alumni. It's an ad for an actual product, the Black Spot Sneaker, a shoe created by Adbuster that mimics the products marketed by Nike. If you, if you look closely at the ad's text, you'll see that the shoe is designed for only one purpose, kicking Phil's ass. <laughs> Actually, I don't think the really important message here is the part about kicking Phil's ass. But rather, it's the headline, Rethink the Cool. This ad takes one of the most important and psychological themes that is used to market many products today, the idea of being cool. And it asks young consumers to question what they associate with that term, and perhaps to change what they associate with being cool. Now, in 2008, after uh, returning to my roots in the graphic arts, I taught a course at the Art Institute of Chicago titled Advertising as a Medium for Protest. The course consisted of a wide-ranging <laughs> survey the course consisted of a wide-ranging survey of artists who were using or had used advertising techniques for this purpose. Now, incidentally, this image of Chairman Mao wearing a Nike cap is not mine. It comes from the cover of a book by a leading Spanish, by the head of a leading Spanish advertising agency. One important component in my course was a sharp criticism of the critics of advertising, whom I felt too often dismissed image consciousness and visual thinking as uh, inferior forms of thought. I used this famous image by the Belgian painter Magritte to illustrate their predicament, what I call the critic's dilemma. Words versus images. The text beneath the pipe reads, this is not a pipe. But you can see how powerless the words are <laughs> when set off against <laughs> the pipe itself. In effect, for decades now, I think critics have fought images mainly with words. A losing battle, in my opinion, Given the immense power of image consciousness and symbolic thought in the cultural life of all societies throughout human history. Unfortunately, this is the way that many critics of advertising portray consumers. They picture them as lab monkeys or uh, frivolous robot-like creatures. From their earliest concerns about subliminal advertising in the 1950s to the latest uh, theories, uh, semiotic theories of deconstruction and media literacy, the critics of advertising have often demonstrated a profound bias against the nature of images as a means of communication. The paradigm that is most commonly invoked is the idea that advertising uses images to bypass reason, to influence consumers through their unconscious thought process. In effect, the critics seem to be saying that people are not thinking 
when using the language of images and symbols. Such criticism relegates image consciousness and visual thinking to inferior forms of mental activity, perhaps not even forms of thought at all. In my opinion, the power of advertising stems from a real human need, the need for symbolic thought and symbolic meaning. The advertisers understand this much better than their critics do. The real issue is what values and beliefs the images and symbols serve. Over the years, I've discovered that my ad collages are not just about the Vietnam War or protest themes. They are really about the medium of advertising itself and the <laughs> values and beliefs that it com communicates. That is one reason I think the collages still have so much impact today. Because while the Vietnam War ended long ago, the advertising medium has changed very little. There is still a lot of work to be done in changing the visual narrative that motivates us. Images and symbols reflect our most basic values and beliefs. In my view, they are the mental constructs that need to be reinvented. If we are to give cultural life to values other than anorexia and militarism. Just for the record, <laughs> <laughs> just for the record, I'm still working occasionally with found, found objects. <laughs> yeah, for the, as Jeff pointed out, for the 2008 uh, presidential election, I created a series of Sarah Palin alarm clocks with alarms that would only sound if she were elected. <laughs> There were 10 different models in the series, including this one, which I call the only a heartbeat away model. <laughs> As a kind of party favor for tonight, I brought copies of a small booklet that I published, which contains all 10 models, plus some quotes from Sarah. And it's a freebie if you would like to have it on your way out. I've not devoted much energy lately to uh, creating more ad collages, but this, this one was, which I call the Marlboro Sunset, was created in 2004 to protest the Iraq War. In the past few years, the focus of my artwork has shifted to another realm of the advertising world, one that combines my interest in using advertising for protest with performance art and street theater. This billboard-sized uh, projection of the Marlboro collage was made possible by the development of mobile project, uh, projection equipment that enables me to project my own advertising messages on walls around town. The projection can be made from an automobile like the one you see in the parking lot here <laughs> or from my wheelchair unit which can go almost anywhere, including inside buildings, because everything is wheelchair accessible these <laughs> days. <coughs> this image was part of, a, of another series of projections protesting renditions and torture at Guantanamo. I don't see why our superheroes should not be captured and made to deliver messages like this one. For me, protest advertising is a way of confronting a cultural system in which advertising icons and brand names are treated like sacred cows. And corporations have too much power over our symbolic thought and visual thinking. During the recent Occupy Wall Street demonstrations in the fall of 2011, I created a mobile projection called the Occupy Wall Street ticker tape. 
when projected on a wall, this simple typewriter animation uh, mimics the lighted signs that deliver stock quotes and business news to the public. There were some 30 headlines in the ticker tape that ran continuously. Here are a few more examples of the messages I projected. The Wells Fargo Bank in downtown Eugene <laughs> was kind enough to lend me their wall <laughs> on several occasions for my Occupy Wall Street ticker tape, which included messages for some of their own executives. <laughs> this ticker tape projection was made inside the, ci the City Hall Terrace during a critical City Council meeting concerned with the removal of the occupiers from their campsite. In closing, I encourage you to keep your eyes peeled <laughs> on walls around town. <laughs> this counterculture artist is still alive and kicking in the streets outside the museum world. You might see something like this projected in the near future. I'm currently working on a new series of projections about the climate crisis and endangered species. I call this new series of projections Advertising Extinction. In this collage, the Marlboro Man joins other extinct animals <laughs> in a kind of landscape of lost creatures, the final frontier for one of America's most enduring advertising icons. Thank you for joining me tonight. I uh, will be happy to answer any questions you may have and uh, sign books afterwards if we have time to do that. Yeah. I'll meet. <laughs> <coughs> So hang on this side, Jeff, because I hear better over here. <laughs> yeah. I like to think I'm his agent, but I'm actually just his assistant. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually, Jeff, I forgot to tell you. I'm looking forward to shows in Kyoto and Tokyo. Absolutely. That next yeah, meal. Okay. All right. We'll work on that right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions here? Oh, look at that. All right. Have you been sued for copyright infringement? That's a great question. Um, no, but thanks to, the, uh, to Google, about four or five years ago, I just searched advertising the contradictions, <coughs> Violet Ray. Up came a legal opinion about the book that was published in 1984. Someone in 1985 had written an article. It's for a rather odd publication that I haven't been able to locate. It has to do with sports and things, but um, the article was about trademark dilution, which is a near neighbor to copyright violation. And interestingly enough, there was a two or three paragraphs uh, commenting on my collages. Well, yes, there is definitely trademark dilution. That was clear, but he said uh, it's not worth fighting about. <laughs> Not because of the financial things, but because of the publicity that it would create. So I think what happened to Bill Dunaway uh, in the 1960s was uh, very symptomatic. Uh, unfortunately, there were, I couldn't get anyone in the 30 days of the 60s who I thought should have been willing to take a little risk and publish these and stir the pot. And they were, they didn't do it. And so it's, uh, Commentary on something. Hmm. I, I just was wondering if you could, for a moment, let us know about this image. Is this, this is just the logo that I use. It's a cut up. It's a collage kind of it. I, I, I like this figure, uh, I, you know, as a sort of decoy. I, it, when people go to uh, find Violet Ray, 
they find this uh, sometimes. And um, so, you know, I, I, I also like the slight aggression in the <laughs> way she's using that pencil. <laughs> Who, what image is it? This is an original image that has a pen. No, it's a cut out from some ad somewhere. Uh, she probably was uh, pointing to something to do with uh, UPS or something. I don't know what. <laughs> no, I, 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 it's a cut out. You know, it's a collage. Uh, I should, I, I was not very um, conscientious about taking, making records of all the image sources. For this lecture, I went back, uh, fortunately, uh, Google enabled me to locate a lot of the ads and uh, to put time frames on things in a way uh, that I hadn't done. It was a furious time, uh, uh, beginning 1966, the last five years there of the 60s, really. I think the bottom line is, is I don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, <laughs> I, I still do. I still have my scissors, by, and I, I enjoy the cutting a, a part of it. But um, even that collage that you saw, the late collage, the one, uh, the Marlboro Sunset collage, you know, yeah. Not rubber cement, but <laughs> <laughs> so somebody, is there any other questions? Huh? In the far back in there. Oh. Oh, I just want to say, I looked at your exhibit earlier today and just really, really en en enjoy it and think that it does ring true um, uh, today in importance. You can absolutely see to the movements that are still going on uh, right now and the work that many of us are doing on campus. And something in particular that I found really interesting is, I think, uh, showing how the images still have so much power is that even when you're calling attention to the Vietnam War, you're calling attention to uh, many uh, forms of oppression that uh, exist and continue today, um, there's often there's this um, the calling out of the normativity of the, the ads places, I think, whiteness in a very central, um, it places whiteness in focus in a way that I don't think is done very often, in a way that's looking directly at like whiteness and white supremacy on each of the images with the normativity that is created through ads. I just wanted to see if you could speak to um, the way that you use race and specifically the way that you look at like whiteness in, in, in your work or white supremacy. You'll have to help me with that. Yeah. He wants to know how you, could you t speak to the issue of using whiteness and the normativity in, in white? Your, your whiteness and the, the way that you use it in your ads. Whiteness and race. Oh, the race thing, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, there, it's a complex issue, but um, the, the amount of racism that's still present in the ads is, is stunning. You know, it's there in, in coded fashion. Um, in the catalog, there are several other examples, good examples of the way, the different ways that I use that, that racial prejudice uh, collaging. Um, some of them are, uh, I think, I, uh, I hesitated to even show them. I mean, because the, the 1960s were a time when the, the, get, the ghetto riot that I referred to here in, in Newark was just one of numerous. So it was like every year there were terrible photos and terrible uh, riots and protests going on. Um, and I can only say that, that uh, so much of the meaning in advertising is hidden that you need to push it to that over the edge. Um, I, I like the example of the, uh, the pantyhose ad because it's so blatant. But there are lots of, the one, the one that I showed actually, uh, the white horse scotch ad, the good guys are always on the white horse. That one's not in, in the show either, but it's in the catalog. And if you look closely at the text, the small text, you'll see that it, it is really racist. <laughs> it develops, you know, in a kind of strange way, a, a racist narrative. <coughs> and the headline itself, uh, you know, to me, 
rings that bell. And so um, I can only encourage you to look more at some of the other collages. I'd be happy to talk to you about it if you wanted to meet personally and, and discuss in more detail. It's difficult to do it here. But so, yeah. Just a question about um, process. You talked about getting the color just right. Is this just, is this serendipity? You found the right image that blended with the color? Or do you do anything, do you add anything um, to make it just right? No, that's Photoshop. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, you can, you can make those adjustments in Photoshop. I think the reason I showed that um, Chevis Regal ad, which is, has the bullets in the bottle, you know. No, those are all, I mean, I had huge piles of cutouts of things that, uh, and yes, serendipity's there on my shoulder, uh, you know, helping me sometimes. Um, but, you, you know, I had taken the step for of wanting to use the advertising, the advertisement for my protest. I could begin to read the radar in the ad what it was saying underneath the uh, front, you know, the text. And, and then I would begin to accumulate images, cut-ups and things that fit. But it was, a long, it was a process of learning over really, I, I actually didn't mention this, but the very first collages that I created, some of them I pasted up on the walls in the New York subway. I was ignorant of what I had sort of discovered. I mean, it, I knew when, it, when I put that Eterna 27 collage together, which was dead simple maybe, but still, whoa, it was just a, a, an explosion. And I saw a lot of potential, but it took a number of years to really become, uh, to get the finesse. And to, and, but it was all, mm, yeah, there was no Photoshop. <laughs> Yes. My we then was myself and my partner, Florica Ramitier, who, uh, you know, we were not a full-blown collective, but um, she was a great inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> she was a great inspiration to me then and, uh, and quite insightful about the nature of advertising. And, and uh, uh, so that was the we. Uh, you know, eventually she moved on, especially after 1967, she became a member of one of the uh, most radical uh, women's uh, liberation groups, uh, which, which was called then, I don't think they call it this anymore, but they used to call it the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. <laughs> and so, <laughs> <laughs> so they were the ones that, that hexed Wall Street, and they did a lot of street theater <laughs> things, and uh, that was the we. of teaching, of course. Yeah, yeah and, and what would you think about the journalism school here actually welcoming a course that critiques, that critiques, critiques yeah. of advertising? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, I've tried to get them to do that. I won't name names, but I've been to see people in the uh, communication, uh, journalism communications about this. I gave them copies of my syllabus and uh, that reading packet with the Mao and the whoosh. Uh, I think it's ideal. I got good response in, in Chicago. I was scheduled to teach that course again at the Art Institute, but then the, when the market crashed and uh, their budget shrank, uh, they, they, they cut it. Um, I get tremendous response from, from students. I don't understand why it is they can't take the step. Well, what they say, it's what everybody says. It's the budget, you know. We, we don't have the money for this. 
I think other things are involved, but um, there are some folks in the, in the uh, School of Journalism who've done really cutting edge work on visual thinking, um, who I've talked to and thought maybe would be sympathetic. But I don't, I don't know whether it is the money thing or whether it's uh, something else, is there's a barrier there. Um, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. Yeah. Yeah. The cur young curators who facilitated this are sitting right here, Jesse and yeah. Kathy. So.